Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined, as always, by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, I usually open with a silly intro joke here, but it's June and I actually just want to say happy Pride Month to all of my fellow LGBTQ plus folks out there. And now I'll say hey to the one and only Matt Morgan. Well, kind of on, on brand here then. Um, I did learn today actually that there actually only are two states in the United States of America. There's Indiana and then there's out Deanna. <laughs> so, that's so silly. Wait, I live in Washington. Is there like an unwashington? Is like Dur- dir- I be worried dirty about tin, this? dirty tin, dirty tin. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're not washing it, you're you're just dirty. I, I get you, I get you. Oh man. Well, that was the one and only Matt Morgan, and also joining us is the one hundred and only Dana Roach. Um, in honor of Baldur's Gate, a little D and D humor for you. A human and elf uh, walk into a bar. The gnome walked under it. Uh, <laughs> Cheers, to Frodo. Know? Mr. Frodo would not appreciate that one. <laughs> I. Uh, appreciate. Anyway, this is the EDH RecCast. EDH Rec is the best deck building resource on the web for the commander format, compiling data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks. And here on the podcast, what we'd like to do is give all of that data a little more context. Matt, do you mind telling us what it is that we are discussing in this week's episode? Well, this week, we're, we're so used to shaking our fists at clouds that this week, we're actually going to talk about cards that we used to hate, but we actually have come <laughs> around on them and, and we don't shake our fists at them quite so hard and maybe even cards that we like ourselves. Yeah, no no more uh, old man yells at clouds stuff. No. This is very much about uh, Maybe a little bit of that. I, I am maybe still here. <laughs> <laughs> no no promises. No, pro- that's, that's very fair, Dana. That's very fair. But yeah, cards that we have eventually learned to uh, to love, learned to like a little bit, or or I don't know, we'll, we'll see. Just like how emotions have changed. Maybe when we first saw a card, we were kind of like, it made us a bit grumpy, but then we've moved away from that grumpiness and we want to see uh, how that feels because EDH is a really interesting game in all of those ways. And it's funny to see how our relationships to those cards change as well. Real quick, before we get into our main topic, we want to thank Chase, aka Manikers, for helping us with the post-production of the show. Thank you so, so much, Chase. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors for the show as well. The EDH RecCast is sponsored by Card Kingdom and TCG Player. It's like having the greatest dungeon master ever fill your orders. <laughs> Just go to EDH Rec, pick the card in question, and select the vendor link down below. Doing so supports both the site and the show. And if you prefer to support the show directly, you can do so over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. We have patron tiers of all levels where they want to see all the episodes a day early. Maybe you want to join the Discord community that we have going on over there. There's all that and more. Just a great way to support the show and get yourself some perks in the process over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. And we even have that special super tier. Uh, Let's brag on ourselves. It's a pretty super tier where we give people a (laughs) shout out every single week just for joining and supporting us. So this week, we do want to give that shout out to Ryland Shinbine. So Ryland, thank you so much. We definitely appreciate the support and uh, hopefully don't take one on the shin because that uh, that would sting just quite a bit. Matt, Matt, how, why? why? You thought you would get away from it, but like (laughs) where there's a will, there's a way. Matt has to make jokes about the everything, about the everything. There's no stopping you. And you know what, Matt, starting us on our topic here, that's one thing that I've uh, learned to love. That's one thing that I'm no longer grumpy about. You, Your jokes bring me joy, even if they did initially make me face palm a whole lot. So there we go. How's that, that for a start? That, to that's, that's an acceptable first step, yes. Cool, cool. Yeah, let's get into that main topic. We are talking about cards. We used to hate cards. We learned to love. Maybe love is a strong word, but, you know, cards that had an emotional reaction from us. And over time, we're kind of like, actually, you know what? Meh. It's not It's not so much. Um, and we've got some personal examples that we want to share. But, you know, I think before we even get into some of the uh, some, some of our personal uh, the, the things that like made us each individually a little bit I don't know if salty is the right word, but like, I feel like for this topic, we actually kind of have to like start with like some of the ones we've noticed over time from the community, like cards that we saw the community had a very big reaction to, but maybe, you know, the emotions have changed over time. Like Dana, feel free to take the floor. Like, are there cards that you've noticed that the community had a very strong initial reaction to that has kind of mellowed out over time? A jeweled Lotus would definitely be one. And, And understandably so at first glance, it looks absolutely terrifying. 
but by and large, it's just not something that has altered the face of non-competitive commander all that much. I can't really think of the last time I've seen one, and the few times I've seen one, it's been an effective card, but it hasn't been game-breaking for the most part. Yeah, this actually might be one of my favorite designs from the original Commander Legends set because it reads like really saucy. But ultimately, I think we as a community kind of discovered that effectively Jeweled Lotus, which makes you three mana just for your commander, it's kind of like another Dark Ritual, which is just like one mana to make three mana temporarily. Like there's some amazing stuff that you can do with it. I know that uh, Duretti decks really, really enjoy Jeweled Lotus a whole lot, for example. Um, like it, it's a spicy card, but it was not the game-breaking doomsday situation that ever. Like the internet exploded when Jeweled Lotus came out, and like it's been it, and that's about it. Well, it's also one of those cards where it it wants you to play a certain type of game. If you are playing a game where your deck wants Jeweled Lotus, your deck also wants a bunch of other uh, hyper competitive mana rocks that, you know, it, it wants your, your, your mox opals and your chrome moxes and those kind of mana rocks for the most part. People don't just tend to do one of those. Like you didn't look at your deck and, and decide I need to run a bunch of zero drop mana rocks now to play hyper competitive because I found a jeweled lotus. People just tend to either play that way or they don't. And jeweled lotus didn't really change that for the most part. You either want to do that or it's, or, or it's not the way your play group played and people that don't play that way just tended to not run it yeah it, i think a lot of what the community did was they saw lotus in the name they saw it was an artifact <laughs> that made three mana and the conclusions then were leapt to not jumped to but leapt they, <laughs> they, they 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 knocked over some tables in the process it was i think now most people have kind of realized like a one-time shot in the arm with mana a ritual yes is, is it powerful absolutely that that's we're not taken away from that but the reaction to and and kind of what the the community turned into for a, a short while uh the reaction was definitely overblown for sure and frankly i feel like commander legends had a couple of other examples of this for example um opposition agent and actually tevish zot also incurred some pretty extreme reactions when they were first released opposition agent of course being able to steal stuff that your opponents tutored for like you get that stuff instead of them when that came out, people had some words about it. And Tevish Zot as well has an ultimate that can take commanders right from other people's command zones. And I remember seeing quite a lot of the discourse about that type of thing too. And those cards feel ultimately kind of like, eh, you know, fine. Like, Jeweled Lotus Opposition Agent and Tevish Zot were not the problems from the Commander Legends set. Hole Breacher was the problem from the Commander Legends set. And somehow those three cards got way more attention than Hole Breacher did. And Hole Breacher was just like, actually, I might be the issue here, y'all. So it's just, I don't know. It was very funny to me to see where the reactions all went to. Because some cards do read a very specific way. But, you know, when you actually play them, I don't know. I think Tevish Zot is really, really fun. I also, I don't know that I've seen an Opposition Agent in the wild yet because for the most part, playing in paper is just now starting starting to get back to what we saw, you know, before 2020. So mm. the more that we have in-person events moving forward, the more I think Opposition Agent might come back into the forefront of, oh, this card actually sucks to play against <laughs> because it absolutely does suck to play over webcam because you're searching people's libraries, which is just very, very difficult when you're in different states and you're playing over webcam. So when in-person events come back and in we're actually like seeing people and in which sounds unheard of. <laughs> yeah. Opposite opposition agent might come back into the, Oh, nobody likes to play against this card because it is just such an awful experience. Well, and I don't want any of this to sound like we're disparaging the people who had a, a big emotional reaction to some of these cards. Like they are electrifyingly worded cards. They do have a very big impact on your brain when you read them. But, you know, we have seen certain sky is falling reactions all the time whenever there's a whole new set. And, and in fact, Matt, I know that there are a couple of cards that you've kept track of over time that you like when you first read them, you were just like, oh, this is just like fun, cool, exciting. Why is everyone mad about it right now? I think this is actually perfectly cool, y'all. What's going on? And I know that there are a few that you've kept track of over time. There's a few that just I, I always love to point back to because, yes, whenever there's a mythic that costs five mana or more, uh, I feel like 
there's always going to be some sort of overblown reaction. My my favorite <laughs> example of this of all time might be Doom Whisperer. <laughs> so for those of you who don't remember when this card was previewed, it's uh, three black black for a nightmare demon with flying and trample, and you can pay two life and you surveil two. And surveil two as you look at the top two cards of your library, you can put them e- either into the graveyard or on the top of your library in any order. So it's it's kind of like a, a, a graveyard scry, effectively. Hmm. Uh, the community reaction was saying that this was, should not have been allowed to be opened in packs. Like, uh, it should be banned immediately, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, okay, well... It fine. <laughs> it's fine. You only have 40 life on 100 cards in your deck. So, like, I, I get it, but also, what's what's the outrage? And I remember that this was probably one of my favorites, but there's always one every set. Uh, Cultivator Colossus, I remember everybody <laughs> clamoring of, oh, this card, it has to be banned before the set even comes out. And... <laughs> Right. Here we are, but like Doom Whisper is in thirteen thousand decks. That's it. That it, it it's a good card. That that card puts in a bunch of work in my Conrad deck. But it's also one of those cards that like kind of tempts you by making you pay a whole bunch more life. And like I, I don't know. I like it. It's fine. It, it is like I, I I am surprised to see five mana six six Flamplers as like a power creep design element over time but sure i don't know it's it's cool i have fun when people play this card like a lot of fun when then this card cards in play but matt i'm actually really surprised that you didn't mention nyx bloom ancient because man i remember that one really blowing up the internet and you know tripling your mana oh that's so exciting but it's also a seven mana creature you know what i think is kind of interesting is the reaction for a problem card doesn't seem to be everyone freaking out about how problematic the card is. When everyone like loses their minds about, you know, Jeweled Lotus or something, and it winds up not being a problem, or, or, or Nyx Fum Ancient, or, or Tavish Zat, or whatever it is, the sign that a card might be a problem is when everyone starts freaking out about how they can't wait to do degenerate things with it. I remember <laughs> the reaction to Paradox Engine was like, I can't wait to take 30 minute turns. I'm like, well, that that was the problem. <laughs> like the fact that a bunch of people were really excited to use Leovold to wheel away everyone's hand, that should have been your warning sign. Not that everyone was scared of a card. It should be when a bunch of people are like, I can't wait to do degenerate things and keep everyone from playing. So I, I feel like excitement is much more a bar for concern, much more a cause for concern than everyone being worried. That's an interesting take. And all of these cards too, I think a good amount of the the original you know, fear about them when they were coming out was the rule zero and the, just the social aspect of the format, I think, is being proven as successful because these cards aren't problems. You know, yes, there's po- there's always potential to, to but break any card, really, but these haven't been. And people have kind of like, OK, it's powerful. We get it. If that's your game, cool. But if not, like it, it's fine. And so I, I think that's the, the social aspect of the format and keeping this out of playgroups that don't want that type of game has done a pretty good job of that. Yeah, I, I think for me, honestly, the lesson here is that this is actually kind of an entertaining part of preview seasons when new sets come out. Like I remember when the Xander uh, card was previewed very, very recently, and that's the Grixis or Maestro's commander that like cuts people's hands in half and libraries in half. And I also remember seeing a very electric reaction to that card's release. And like it's a seven mana commander. It's actually a little bit tough for this to really pull off. And it's frankly kind of exciting when it can do a whole bunch of stuff. And like seeing a big emotional reaction is just to me a sign that people care a whole lot about the game and it's kind of fun to ride some of those waves um it, like i don't know there, there are pieces of that that i can enjoy when things go a little bit overblown and like harsh language starts being used that's when it's just like all right let's let's all zoom out take a step back but most of the time i see a lot of really big reactions to stuff and i'm just like this is a sign of how much people love this game and and that to me is what i like so much so i think that this will always be a process that is with us and it's always good to check our initial reaction versus our inaction our our reaction over time as as time moves on and this is something that i've learned when it comes to for example infect like triumph of the hordes for example infect that's a card that a lot of people really don't like because you can play it and sort of immediately clock the table but to me infect isn't really a whole big problem there because every time that i've seen triumph of the hordes would win the game with infect an overwhelming stampede also would have won the game with basically the same board state. So these are cards that, you know, over time, I really do feel can we can kind of mellow out and it's fun to ride those waves sometimes. Well, to to Matt's point, I, I think rule zero does affect a lot of these things for sure. Um, and maybe that's a good jumping off point to talk about some of the, the personal cards we've kind of came around on. Mm. Um, and one of them for me would be, would be Turgrid, God of Discarding Your Hand or whatever it's called. I forgot the full name. <laughs> 
Um, and, and I still don't like Turgrid, and I think I've played three games against Turgrid decks, and they weren't particularly enjoyable so far. But you know what's coming. Like, I, I, I wasn't surprised. I, I, I knew exactly what the game was going to be like. I knew what the deck was going to be like, and I had an opportunity to opt out. There, there was no surprise there. So while I, I don't love Turgrid and I don't particularly personally enjoy playing against that style of deck, I, it's not really a problem as a commander, I don't think, because everything is just right there on the table. When a person flips over their commander, for the most part, you have the opportunity to just opt out of that game because you know exactly what's coming. Uh, I really kind of appreciate that about the deck. There's just no surprises there. And as a result, I think it winds up not really being a problem in a way I was a little bit concerned about because, like you said, the, the rule zero conversation just covers a lot of that. So I think it's ironic that you bring that up because this is a card I still have not come around on, but like 100%. <laughs> um, and I, honestly, like, isn't it almost kind of a problem on its own that this card makes people want to opt out of games? That's, that's to me, that's kind of a signpost of a card that you know isn't probably healthy for the format. I don't disagree with that portion of it, but the fact remains you can opt out. I I, I just, I, I get what you're saying and don't disagree. Like I said, I didn't enjoy any of the Turgid games I have played, but I knew <laughs> well, what I was getting know. into. It wasn't a situation where I got surprised by it, I guess I should say. So like for me, that's why it wound up not really being a problem and why I've kind of come around and like, hey, if you want to play that way, everyone involved knows you're playing that way for the most part. Um and additionally, it's also one of those cards where, like, there are some cards I think sometimes that can be problematic in games that are very tempting to people who don't realize they're problematic in games. Hmm. That's not the case with Turgrid for the most part either. I think, again, when someone's playing Turgrid, there's a lot of intentionality with it and there's a lot of, like, awareness about what it's doing. So, again, you don't get it accidentally causing problems because it's right there for everyone to see both what the player is doing and when you're playing against it, what's going to happen. You get it causing problems on purpose, not on accident. Yeah, <laughs> and I use the term problem loosely. Like for some people that isn't a problem, it's, it's a fun way to play and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but like if you don't enjoy that, um, it would be a problem. But it's, it's just easy to duck, I think, for the most part. Th this is so funny to me because like th this episode will be cards that – a few of us on the podcast have maybe learned to be yes. okay with it, yeah. but not 100% of us. And like, <laughs> right. this, this is nuance that's important to state. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I struggle with Turgrid still because yes, you can opt out, but a lot of players, especially newer players or younger players, they don't really understand that quite yet. And I think that's a lesson that you, sometimes you have to learn the hard way and like that, that sucks. Sure. That, that's, that's a lesson you have to learn that way. Uh, hopefully it becomes more okay in the community for people to be able to opt out of games like that because it definitely can still lead to some very undesired. You even said it yourself, like you, it's, you've not enjoyed those games, but you still opted in. Sure. Mm -hmm. Th that is, I think, one of the most important aspects of Rule Zero conversations that I hope uh, we learn to encourage more and more is like feeling comfortable drawing your own line, like feel comfortable mm -hmm. saying no to stuff that you don't like. Um, like if you're always saying no, that's probably something that you probably do need to investigate about yourself, but like, don't feel pressure just because three out of the four people are saying yes. Like, you don't have to go along with it if it's something that you're like, eh, I don't know, this might not be for me. Um, like, feel encouraged to do that. Here, here though, Matt, like, that was one of Dana's cards that he's like, you know, he's he's fallen out of hate with Turgrid. Um, you obviously, you still got, you're still like, mm, there's a still a lot of hate with that. <laughs> there you go. But now I'm curious to hear about a card that you personally have learned to move on from. And I'll be very curious to see whether it's a card that Dana or I both still really dislike. <laughs> so my first card that I'm going to talk about is it kind of stands for a category of cards almost, but it's basically going to be spell swindle and all of these expensive counter spells. And mm. part of it is because I had my own hurdles coming from modern legacy, those competitive formats where, oh man, if it's why play any other counterspell other than counterspell if you can just play counterspell? There's no reason to. So And so for me, the process of learning and growing about Commander, and a lot of it too was kind of lessons that Dana talked about with Overwhelming Intellect, which was one of his favorite cards. So instead of looking at it as a counterspell, look at it as the counterspell part is the backup. That's the secondary aspect of it. So Spell Swindle is three blue blue for an instance says counter target spell. You create X treasure tokens where X is that spells converted mana cost, and 
man, when you think of it as, oh, this is a ritual that also gets to like stop something from happening. That's fantastic. If you have artifacts, matters, treasures are literally everywhere, folks. I don't know if you've noticed in 2022, there's so many treasures and this is just such a fantastic one or, or one of Dana's favorite cards, Overwhelming Intellect. Looking at it as a draw spell that just happens to stop a big scary creature from coming down. That type of attitude, I think for me, helped really open up the format to all of these things. We we can't use these spells in other formats. And that's what, to me, makes Commander so enjoyable. So Spell Swindle, at first, I kind of rolled my eyes. Why would you spend five mana on a counter spell? But it really is just such a wonderful card. And while Matt was talking there, I made three treasures. <laughs> Fair. Okay. That's how easy it is to do that these days. Yes, that's that's so funny. Th this is so interesting that you're coming at uh, this was a card that you disliked being the person playing the card yes. as opposed to uh, this was a card across the table from you. That's a really interesting uh, point to make. There's a lot of, again, nuance that comes into each of these. Um, I, I like Spellswindle. I like a whole, I like Spellswindle. It's it's a fantastic card. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, this is this is just a card that like uh, brings me joy. This this is a, this is a happiness point for me for sure. But a card on my list as a card that I do have a bit of a love hate relationship with is also a counter spell. Uh, Matt, I'm curious to see what your feelings would be about Fierce Guardianship, the ever so famous counterer of non creature spells. As long as you control your commander. Like, this to me is like, why is it three mana? I feel like this should be a five mana spell instead of a three mana spell. There's a lot I'd have liked to change about this card. But I have learned that I actually don't hate the design space of get benefit if you control your commander. I actually do really like that because it does kind of force you to take a little bit of risk with most commander playstyles. Like, you have to commit something to the board to get a good benefit. I do wish that maybe more of these free spells had been a bit more like obscuring haze where they're more situational because like, you know, fierce guardianship, when are you going to cast a counter spell other than to protect your commander, you know? So like, I am still a teensy bit frustrated about it, but this card is not like the, uh, the, the devastating emotional reaction that I had to it. It was just like, oh, why? Like that has definitely mellowed out over time. So Matt, when it comes to counter spells, I'm curious to see if uh, you have the same history as I do with this one. Um, so I own some Fierce Guardianships and I play them in, in a few decks, but also having different spells and different cards that interact with your commanders being in play, I, I think that's such a unique aspect of the commander format that I think it was mm. kind of a natural evolution. Like you had to expect it because we've had cards with the, the lieutenant mechanic for, for a while now where mm. you get an extra benefit if you have your commander in play or at the beginning or whenever this happens, if you control your commander, you get extra. So the, the fierce guardianship and flawless maneuver, those types of cards in this whole cycle they're all great. There there's situations for all of them. Deadly Rollick, I know, is one that I think all three of us have, have cast timer three. And so yeah, it's it's a space that I'm not surprised that we got to because A, all the, the cards have precedent for having some sort of effect on a normal card, but just having the benefit of being able to play it in commander and, and be a little more powerful is I think it's fine. It's powerful, yes, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I, while I agree with Joey, there are things I would change about it. I, I would say what kind of turned me around a little bit on Fierce Guardianship was the fact that there's been on more than one occasion where I've had it in hand and thought I was safe, and then a Crater Hoof came out, or a <laughs> you know Gray Merchant came down when the person had you know eleven or twelve pips up or something. Like there's been enough situations where the fact that it doesn't hit creatures have been relevant. So like that kept it from feeling quite as just instantly broken as I, I, I thought on first blush. And and this to me also represents, uh, I hope I phrase this correctly, I might not, but to me there is a difference between hating Eminence and hating Edgar Markov. Like Edgar Markov is a very strong Eminence commander, but, but Eminence as a concept doesn't bug me. And the same is true with these free spells. Like the free spell, if you control a commander concept, I really have come to appreciate that. I don't necessarily like the execution on Fierce Guardianship, just like I don't necessarily like the execution on Edgar Markov, but I don't completely dislike Arabo. I think that is a pretty fair use of the eminence as a keyword. I think that like the concept as a whole is not inherently a failure. And that is an important you know lens for us to view things through is just like, don't let one thing ruin the entire concept is an important lesson for me. And this is one of the cards that helped me learn that lesson, which I think is pretty valuable. Well, early on, we talked about some cards where people snap freaked about Jeweled Lotus or, um, <laughs> you know, Nick's Full Ancient or whatever. Um, a couple cards where I did that initially was the Modern Horizons 2 suspend cards that were basically like new copies of some old hyper powerful reserve list stuff 
that had suspend as opposed to a casting cost. Um, particularly Gaia's Will, which is the green version of Yagma's Will, and Resurgent Belief, which is just another replenish. Hmm. I was immediately like, I wanted Resurgent Belief for an Enchantress deck, but I was like, I can't believe they gain, gave green Yagma's Will. It's a crazy powerful card and green did not need that. So I had a couple of days where I was like, what is going on? <laughs> that is insane. <laughs> and had I just taken a moment to take a deep breath, it's not like they haven't done that before with suspend cards in the past. Ancestral Visions has been around for, you know, a dozen years or so and has not been a problem at all. And Ancestral Recall is one of the most broken cards ever printed. <laughs> suspend takes a lot of the wind out of the sails of those kind of cards. And I knew that. I just immediately was like, oh my God, these are going to be a giant problem. <laughs> and they aren't a problem at all to the point where I don't know if I've seen either of them cast in a game of Magic. Yeah, these uh, suspend is such a hard mechanic to gauge because yes, it's, it's easy to break it if you're playing Cascade effects or anything like that. But also it, that requires so much build around that you're taking away from whatever else. So you're, you're not even building around your commander at that point. You're building around maybe one or two cards in the deck. Mm. And that just, to me, is not the ideal way. Yes, you, maybe you want to build around synergies, but building around specific cards. If, the, if these are the only suspend cards in your deck, you're never really going to be casting them for free. <laughs> right. And, and that's where, for me at least, these get tempered to a healthy place where, yes, are they powerful? Absolutely. They do very big things. It, yeah, Replenish is fantastic, but having to wait three turns... People see it coming. Telegraphing these types of effects gives people a chance to respond. And when people have a chance, you know, especially multiple turns to respond, that's where a lot of that that power that I, that people initially feel goes away. But Matt, if you cascade into them for free, then they could potentially right off of the bat. No, I'm absolutely kidding. I'm being completely facetious here. They are fun with cascade. I like these. You, you can you can cast them for free with a rich card's expertise, and that I do like. Oh. That's, Matt, it's so broken. Uh, no. <laughs> you use the operative word. They're fun to cast with Cascade, but like they're not game altering or game breaking. <laughs> it's like such a crapshoot to actually hit them that when you do, you feel like you won the lottery as opposed to it being something broken. So, yeah. and again, like I, I knew that based on past history, but um, I, my initial word response was to, to f freak out like we had talked about before and <laughs> they were just not remotely a problem and I should have known better for sure. Listen, I appreciate, like, when we see a card and we have an emotional reaction to it, I appreciate having a drama queen moment. So, Dana, I'm glad that you get to feel that. Matt, I'm glad that you get to feel it, too. You know, like, that's just how it goes sometimes. I appreciate that. I think it's nice to feel the moment, but also to move on from the moment. And you know what? I'm sure we have a whole bunch of others that we want to share. But let's do that in part two of the episode, because right now I think it would be really fun to challenge some stats. What do you guys say? It's just one of our favorite things to do here on the podcast. There's so much data on EDA track, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes I think the cards see too much or too little play. So we'd love to challenge those statistics. Matt, do you want to start us off this week? What's your challenge? Yeah, I can definitely do that. So my challenge this week is going to be for the commander that I think has gotten me tagged in more Twitter posts than any other that I can imagine. Mm. And that is Ginny Faye Jetmere's second. So Ginny Faye is one of the new Naya uh, commander, Naya colored commander. So red, white, and a green. Uh, I forget what house or what gang that she's in because everything Cabaretti. just... Cabaretti. Cabaretti. It all blurs together. I'm And I'm also a boomer when it comes to paper magic. So <laughs> Naya is where we're at. Um, but Ginny Faye uh, is the elf druid that uh, whenever you create one or more tokens, you create that many 2-2 two, two green cat creature tokens with haste or that many 3-1 green dog creature tokens with vigilance. And as a self-proclaimed uh, dog person, I very much appreciate that. So... One card that I think isn't getting enough attention, it's one of those cards that falls into a category we talk about a lot on this podcast where it's getting you the effect that you want and then oftentimes just a little bit extra and oftentimes for the same amount of mana, maybe a little bit extra. So Raise the Alarm cards are being played in Ginny Fade decks quite a bit. And there's one with that just extra little bit of upside that I think people are overlooking so far. And that card is Verdant Command. So Verdant Command is one in a green for an instant that says choose two. And you get to have target player create two tapped one one green squirrel creature tokens or... Uh, counter loyalty ability of a target planeswalker or exile target card from a graveyard and finally target player gains three life so when you compare this directly to raise the alarm which is being played in more Ginny Fey decks than verdant command it, it's just kind of a no-brainer raise the alarm just as an instant that creates two one one white soldier creature tokens 
when you compare it to Verdant Command that gets you those tokens. Granted, they are tapped, I do get that. So they're not good emergency blockers, but you get to do a little bit extra there. I think the upside is just so obvious that this should be in more than just 9% of the over 1,000 decks that Ginny Faye currently has. It's just, like I said, it's one of those little categories that people, I think, overlook just a little bit and really can get all those little incremental increases in value over the course of your your the deck's lifetime. So Verdant Command, if you're playing Raise the Alarm cards or anything like that, Verdant Command is just one of those upgrades that you're going to get the, the effect that you wanted, but also a little bit bonus. Wait a second, Matt. Did you say that one of the modes on Verdant Command is to exile a card from a graveyard? It is exile target card, yes. So you're saying that if you built Ginny Fey and you use this card, you'd be able to make wonderful dogs and then taunt me while you're making those wonderful dog tokens by exiling my precious cards from my graveyard. So they're taking the card from your graveyard and then they're digging a new hole for it in my backyard and then placing it there. See... This episode is all about cards that we've learned to love and cards that we no longer hate, but graveyard exile effects, I will always hate. Joey is, Joey's learning to hate this card. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. I should move on to my challenge now, and mine is our listener submitted challenge. It comes from our listener Duo Necro in our Discord. And uh, this is a really fun one. It's a very interesting one. Duo Necro points out, has anyone noticed that there are only 70 Vadric Astral Archmage decks that are running the card Clock Spinning? That seems low, doesn't it? Vadric Astral Archmage is the is it commander human wizard from one of the Midnight Hunt sets that cares about things becoming day, day becoming night, and also reduces the cost of your instant and sorcery spells equal to its power. And Clock Spinning is a very fun card that we've probably seen do a lot of work in Orvar decks because it's a little buyback spell that you can use to repeatedly target your own stuff. And with Vadric reducing the cost of this spell, you could make Clock Spinning go down to as low as one mana. And that does seem really, really fun to cast over and over and over again, triggering a whole bunch of like gutter snipe effects, for example. Or if you have a plus one counter on Vadric, you can just repeatedly use clock spinning, target your Vadric, and put another counter onto your commander just for one mana over and over again. Reduce the cost of all of your spells. Like, yeah, this seems like a really fun payoff to use if you've got a whole bunch of those spell trigger effects that you want to do. So uh, do a Necro on Discord. I really like this pick here. Clock spinning sounds like a whole lot of fun for Vadric. And let's face it, since Vadric cares about day becoming night and night becoming day, clock spinning just as a name feels also like it's right there perfectly on flavor. So kudos, kudos, and kudos. Well, um, I haven't dug way back into the um, archives of history for a uh, challenge stats here for a while. So let's fix that. <laughs> I'm challenging the stats on Blood Frenzy from way back in Tempest. It's an instant for one and a red. Target attacking or blocking creature gets plus four plus O oh until end of turn. And at the end of turn, destroy that creature. It's in only 331 decks. And commanders that care about creatures dying that happen to be strong, like Crash to Blood, Blood Braided, or commanders that care about creatures attacking people who you aren't you because they're forced to, like Karazakar, oh. or commanders that care about both, like Carter Doomscourge, who cares about creatures <laughs> dying and creatures attacking people that aren't you. Oh, no. Could get a lot of use out of a card. Um, if you're casting it in something like Gisela Blade of Gold Knight, you're hitting somebody for eight damage because Gisela's doubling the damage while killing their creature. If Calmax is tapped when you cast it, you're going to deal eight damage because it's being copied and going on to two creatures potentially, and then kills both of them afterwards. There's a lot of utility in Blood Frenzy, and I think it should see more play in select decks than the 331 decks it's currently in right now. I, I cannot believe that, Dana, you, the master of the card Berserk, the green <laughs> instant combat trick that also destroys stuff and buffs them up, like, you've pulled off some of the most absolutely monumental, like, terrific Berserk plays I've ever seen. And I can't believe you found another one in red. <laughs> this, I'm scared. I'm terrified of you. What is this? I, I currently have Blood Frenzy in two different decks, and it performs great in both of them. So I, 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 I'm speaking from experience here. It's a really, really useful card, and more decks should give it a shot for sure. 
Matt, help me. Help rescue me from this because you know he's going to use that on your creature when he when you attack wait. me. He's going to pump up and kill your yeah. creature. You well, know it's going to happen. <laughs> we, we know it's going to happen and I actually don't mind it because we all know that I have the beefiest creatures on the battlefield. So uh, <laughs> it makes sense. I, I'm going after Joey and Dana's helping me. That's fine. Uh, dang it, this backfired. Okay, it, let's it, just it, move back to our main topic then. <laughs> let's talk more about cards that we have learned to get along with a little bit better. Dana, how about we throw the floor back to you? Please uh, don't talk about Blood Frenzy anymore. Please don't kill off the creatures that I, that are attacking me. Um, please don't pump them up. Tell us about a card instead that you have learned to like a little bit more over time. So, so I'm going to bring it up a notch here. Rather than talk about a card, I will talk about a mechanic or a card type, I guess. In this case, Partners. I really disliked the original partner implementation. I, I was excited for it at first when it was announced, but like once we got the partners and got to play with them, I really came to dislike it because it felt like the way the original partners were created, all of the partner decks I ran into for the most part weren't the kind of deck I particularly enjoyed. They tended to lend themselves into playing really kind of generic good stuff piles of cards and, and that's that's not an insult really yeah like, like that's i don't mean that in a bad way if you enjoy playing that way but like i like seeing a deck looking to do a specific thing hmm. and for the most part most of those original two color partner commanders didn't really do that they all had kind of blandly useful abilities and people tended to pair them up in decks filled with just kind of generically useful card. You, you, so so you weren't seeing a deck doing a specific thing. You were just kind of getting outvalued by a bunch of cards that were just good in every situation in a deck filled with commanders that were just good in every situation. Um, so I really did not like the partner mechanic. And I was very cautious going into the first Commander Legend set when I heard we were going to get another like 120 partners. <laughs> I was really worried about where that was going to go. And instead, we got a whole bunch of kind of niche commanders with partner that did do what I like. They kind of force you to build around a specific deck doing a specific thing. And I have really come to like the partner mechanic as a result of both the Commander Legends implementation and things like partner with where you're where they were running in a specific pairing that was almost always mm. um, designed to do a certain thing or like the friends forever implementation with the stranger things secret lair that we've gotten where it's a limited pool so again you're, you're looking to mix and match a couple specific pairs to try to build a deck i've really kind of come around on partner and i'm looking forward to seeing where they can go with it in the future in ways that are a little more focused because it is a lot of fun i think for me at least when it's being used used in ways that kind of encourage creative deck building as opposed to encourage just looking at lists of like the most popular cards and putting them all in a deck see i i also appreciate the the progress and the the, the lessons they've learned from the original partner implementation mm. to me that shows that that watsi is indeed despite what um, some social media outlets would have you believe uh, <laughs> Wizards of the Coast and the the, the R and D team they they are paying attention they are listening to to feedback and and when it's presented reasonably yes the original partner was too open ended everything was kind of too generic there was no identity and so every time that we've seen uh, either partner come back or a rehash and, and kind of a, a tune of partner like the the new choose a background mechanic I love because yes. it's a very specific it's it's partner let's be real it's partner with non creatures <laughs> and so ha the specific way that it was implemented I think is a great step and they're and they're continuing to do better things like partner with I love partner with I I think it's an absolutely fantastic execution both for the command zone and for putting those cards in 99 of decks. I think it's fantastic. Um, so yes, partner originally was kind of an eye roll because they, I, I think maybe they kind of underestimated what the community was going to do and, and how powerful the mechanic was. But every iteration since then has been incrementally better. I, I, I'm so happy that you brought up backgrounds. I'm sorry, background is one of my favorite things that has happened yeah. in a while. Like, and that's while with the H. Like, I am passionate <laughs> about this. Emphasis on the H in while. 
while, okay? Like, I just, I was terrified that another Commander Legends set would mean that we get a bunch more partners, which makes approximately, I want to get the math right, 10 trillion different partner combinations. But the backgrounds allow for draft flexibility without completely providing a, a huge deluge to the format. And it feels like on theme with the D&D set as well. It feels like it's proper to the set. I don't know. I just... I love it. And y'all know me. I have a lot of partner decks as well. Like my Virdus and Gorm is one of my favorite decks because it's so tricksy and because those two commanders complement each other so nicely. Uh, Matt, I'm so happy that you brought that up. This is definitely something that I like too. And Dana, I can see where your initial frustration came with that. But sometimes, you know, you had to learn the lessons the hard way, so to speak, as designers. And I really think that, Matt, you are also right that like the right lessons have been learned here. Uh, background is so exciting. It's so exciting. All right, now I'm going to bring us back down, though, Matt. What is a card that you hated at first, and maybe what are the lessons that came out of that one? Uh, so these cards, I, I'm going to lose a lot of our listeners, so I'm sorry to you two for losing some of our listeners. Uh-oh. I don't mind anymore. I've come around. It's it's a bell curve. I, I didn't mind them at first, and then I did hate them for, for a significant amount of time, and now I've kind of toned back down on them. Uh, but it's blue cards. I'm sorry to talk about blue cards, but Cyclonic Rift and Expropriate. I think that they are... <laughs> They are absolutely powerful cards for sure, but everything has like there, all, there always has to be something that is the, the most powerful. There has to be a best thing to be doing, and those just happen to be it. But also, like, it's like yes, Cyclonic Rift is a fantastic defensive tool, resets the game, but also expropriate. When you realize that expropriate is just a very expensive mind control, yes, they're going to get one of your permanents. No, folks, never give people extra turns. That's what makes this card miserable to play against. If you just give them a permanent, that it, it's so much easier to just keep the game flowing. So when you consider that, and I, I understand you're also depending on two other people to also agree with you in that mindset, but I don't hate, I don't, I still don't like, but I don't hate <laughs> expropriate and cyclonic rift. Oh, I'm so, I can't believe that you went from something. I'm sure. I'm sure you're all seething right now. Yes. That's no, fine. no, it's it's fine. <laughs> the discourse about cyclonic rift is so literally 2008 that I'm just not even going to even bother with that. It's, like, it's more 2000 and late. Am I right? There it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> that's a black eyed peas lyric. <laughs> the, the thing for me that I, when it comes to expropriate, like I vote time are the most horrifying words in magic. Absolutely. Yes. To me, I actually do still find frustration with expropriate, but not because of like the gameplay of it. My frustration with expropriate is just that I think it's a very poorly designed card. Like the person who casts the expropriate will never gain control of a permanent that they already control. Like they only have one choice to vote time. So to me, I'm just like, I prefer cards that make choices. Like if it's a voting mechanic, I should have a reason to vote a certain, like give me a choice, not a false choice. Like, so to me, I am still frustrated by expropriate, but for design reasons, not for the gameplay reasons. Although for the record, I'm probably not terribly happy if I do see it resolve across the board from me. Yeah, like I've survived plenty of rifts. Um, it's not a super fun card, but I also don't think it's bannable. And I don't get super upset when someone casts it either. It's those things happen. Expropriate, I mean, listen, if your favorite spice is flour, that's fine. If you want to run expropriate <laughs> at this point, I've, you go ahead and do that. If you can't think of another way to win a game, that's fine. I, I, I don't get mad about it. I'm just, I just shrug and go, okay, well, you can have this Whoa. thing. <laughs> oh, man. So yeah, I, I I was I never hated it. I still am just it, it's 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 just very like kind of it's a little bit eye rolly, but <laughs> whatever it is, what it is, it definitely doesn't doesn't annoy me or bother me. And, and sometimes these also strike me as cards like I, I think we've probably all had one of those primal surge type of situations like building a primal surge deck an all permanence deck where primal surge is the only spell in the deck. And when you cast it, you literally get to dump your entire deck into play. And like that sounds so juicy and delightful. But sometimes as soon as you do it once, that's kind of enough. You're kind of like, ah, oh, I did the thing now. I'm not sure if I'm going to love doing that one thing every single time. I think we recently had an episode sort of about this, about like decks that can be a little bit streamlined and a little bit, uh, what was the word that we disagreed about? Similitudinous, Matt. Like <laughs> The the, the, the uh, made up word, yes. Yes, we get it. it it's a real word. Anyway, uh, I, I think that that's kind of a similar situation that happens between Primal Surge and also Expropriate. Like I've cast an Expropriate. I loved playing the Expropriate. And then I was kind of like, hmm, I think I might be done with playing the expropriate. That was also kind of my journey. And it's nice to have those experiences so that you can put them away as well. I'll, I'll move to uh, I'll move to one of my cards that I have learned not to be so aghast by. 
Um, and this is Bolus's Citadel. And I'm actually, before I even talk about my experience with the card, I'm curious, when was the last time that we saw a, a, a Bolus's Citadel? Have y'all seen this card recently? Because I feel like I was really worried about it, but it's one of those that I haven't seen very often either. I, I have one in one deck, and I have not seen one in someone else's deck hit the field in quite some time. Yeah, the, the the last time that I think I saw this card in play was when I was playing on Arena a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, so that that gives you my reference point on the last time that it's yeah, I've interacted with it. It's fine. It's certainly very powerful. Yeah, a six mana legendary artifact. You can look at the top card of your library at any time, and you can play the top card of your library. But if you cast a spell this way, you pay life equal to its mana cost rather than paying its actual mana cost with mana. And this actually was a card that when I saw it, it did give me an initial freak out. I was kind of like, okay, this is a lot of value effectively for free. Like cheating of mana costs is a thing that we have seen time and time again, really cause a lot of havoc in a lot of formats, whether it's affinity or cascade or any of those things. We have a lot of like the weight of magic history is telling us that when you can cheat paying mana for your spells, it's probably something that you should be a little bit worried about. And I did worry a lot about Bolus' Citadel, but it hasn't been nearly as like, ha, ah, as I first thought. That is the technical term, by the way. <laughs> ha is is the, the feeling that I had about this. But like, I'm, I'm kind of like, you know what? It's, this is a lot of value, but it also is a card that is tempting you with a lot of danger as well. And there's an excitement to that that I've really learned to appreciate. Well, I think there's also an intentionality here, like like there was with the um, the Turgrid conversation, where to really truly do something abusive with Bolas the Citadel, you very much have to sculpt your deck ar around using it. Mm. And uh, if people are doing that, if they are going to want to use the card to its maximum efficiency and, and build their deck that way, that isn't really happening accidentally. You're not, you're for the most part not stumbling across that. Your friend that you play with weekly for the most part isn't going to suddenly upend his entire deck, usually to make it into a Bolus of Citadel deck, <laughs> um, to get the maximum efficiency out of it. That's just like not usually how people play the game. There are definitely people that do play, that, that do play in that like power space, but they know what they're doing and you usually do when you're playing against them too. So. It's not the kind of thing I think where you like. I would argue that the biggest problem with Dockside Extortionist is the fact that you can just put it in almost any deck and have it be uber powerful. Mm. That isn't the case with Bolas of Citadel. Like you, for the most part, have to be sculpting your deck to make it do its thing, and that definitely keeps the power in check. Well, and we can kind of say that for several of the cards that we kind of led the show off with, too. Sure, yeah. Yes, Triumph of the Hordes is great, but you have to be able to go wide first. Nyx Blue Mansion is great, but you have to be able to get it out on the battlefield first and, and protect it. There's all sorts of different things that you can be doing that are powerful, but if you're not building around it, or you're not built, built to take advantage of it properly, like a, a Jeweled Lotus is not going to do a whole lot in like my Miri Wetherlight Duelist deck. It just doesn't matter. So <laughs> that's not saying that, that Jeweled Lotus isn't powerful, right. but my deck isn't built to take advantage of it. So it's not just a card that you can just blanket put in any given deck and it's going to do work. No, that, that's not the case for many, many of these cards. Yeah, to me, it is so interesting sometimes to see the things that do prompt an amount of dislike. Because again, like I said earlier, what is so interesting and frankly fun about seeing this this wave of reaction sometimes is like seeing what does like alarm people or or set folks uh set folks a worry in like me seeing free mana stuff with the citadel was the kind of thing that made me worry but that's not necessarily the same thing that made you guys worry like there's a lot of different angles here once again it's super so nuanced but it's also really funny to try and like discover things that like will actually be a little bit more distressing to a greater number of people you know here at ADA track we have those salt scores and we love to take those polls from the community and I don't think it's a coincidence that cards like winter orb and static orb consistently have extremely high salt scores which represents that like a lot of people feel that way and it isn't um quite as individual necessarily on the reactions. Whereas there are, like, here's a funny thing that I've run into recently. There's a Tasha commander now, which I'm so delighted by because my whole family plays magic. My mom's name is Tasha. Tasha is building a Tasha deck. This is happening. I'm, I'm like, I'm so delighted about it. But this commander's actual abilities are to steal stuff from your opponents and also probably to mill them around all at the same time. And stealing people's stuff 
and milling people stuff, that I know is also a thing that not everyone is necessarily on board for all of the time. Like that is a strategy that can get people a worry in as well. In fact, Dana, I think that might even be a strategy that you are the like, mm, no, I don't want to go against that. I want to play my stuff, dang it. Like, so it's just funny to see those differences. For sure. It, it's, it's, it's the kind of, leads the kind of gameplay sometimes that's, that some folks just aren't in the mood for or, or makes them want to target you, I guess I would say. Um, that's a good way to phrase that. And yeah, it, it definitely is one of the things that does that for me a little bit. Yes, that is something I have definitely noticed. It, while my family is making Tasha's Tasha deck, um, I have noticed that it draws a lot of ire because people don't like it when you mill and people people try to attack Tasha. And you know what? I just think that's rude. People shouldn't attack Tasha. <laughs> Should leave Joey's mom alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I have one final one here I want to throw out here that I've come around on. Um, and that's the mechanic mutate. Oh. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> to mutate. Mm, mm. <laughs> what I will say, um, the color red as a whole, um, once upon a time, I just didn't like playing red. And I, I can tell you exactly why. What? I, the, a whole color? We went from cards we don't like to like yep. the whole color? To the color red. <laughs> That's what we're going to close out with here. Plot twist. I did not see this coming, actually. What? Like, I in, in the first probably eight or 10 commander decks I made, I had I didn't have red in any of them. And I, I had this like vibe about red as a color. I, I always pictured <laughs> there's a character in the original Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure movie who, when he's giving his presentation, he's just kind of mumbling about material that makes no sense and then just yells, San Dimas High School Football Rules! And everyone cheers. <laughs> that, that was the color red. Just a big, <laughs> dumb oaf just yelling something really loud to get a cheer that makes no sense and then walking off the stage. Like, that's how I, to me, the color red felt like you were just throwing fireballs and that was it. <laughs> and it took me a long time to kind of come around. I don't know why that is on the gameplay of red and EDH. And I think that what really finally made me kind of appreciate it was when they introduced the impulse draw mechanic. Hmm. It, number one, it gave red some gas that it needed in commander. But number two, it really made it feel like for the first time when I've played red, it, it made it feel like you were making like interesting decisions in a way that at least I personally hadn't ever really encountered when I had played Red and Commander. So having to like deal with, I, I the only way I can get card advantage is with this card that I have to play, you know, in the next turn that everyone can see. That really felt fun to me and it added like a level of complexity to Red that, again, at least I personally hadn't encountered when I played it. So basically ever since Red Cut Impulse Draw, it made me learn to like like the color in a way that for whatever reason, I just couldn't kind of break through on prior to that. I was wondering where you were going with your your story there. <laughs> there was a and lot now, there. It, the, the, but the payoff was indeed worth the setup. I, I will give you that. I am still, I don't. The, <laughs> there was a lot to I process. It was a lot to You process. want to go the rewatch whole, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure now. The whole color though? Like, I just, <laughs> yeah, I, I just didn't. It just felt like dumb goblins and dumb dragons and lightning bolts. <laughs> And, I, and that's me. Like, I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm just saying, like, that was my perception. Whenever I went to add red to a deck, I'm like, I don't need goblins and lightning bolts in this deck. I need, I'm on a color that does interesting stuff. I feel like we have gone from this moment here, Dana. I feel like we have reverted back to the old man yells at cloud situation. <laughs> like, I told I, you I came around on it. I know, but like the whole color. I have seen like, the light. I'm now Dana the Red. Dana the Red. I your next deck building challenge, you have to build mono red. Like I just that's that's how I feel. I, I think I actually I think the last three decks I've built have had red red in them. You know what? Good for you. I'm glad. The whole color. I'm never gonna get over this. All right. That just I don't know. The we all can grow. We have demonstrated growth on this podcast today. That's what I think is important to focus on. My lord, this this will never not be funny to me. I'm sorry. This is absolutely great. We <laughs> those were some of the 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 cards and concepts that that at one point we really weren't necessarily on board with, but we've come around on listeners. We would love to know from you what cards are out there that you had an initial uh, reaction to that has sort of mellowed out over time. Do you hate the color yellow? Is the color purple unacceptable to you? I would just love to know. <laughs> That's. 
I will never let this go. Matt, I'm just going to uh, close out the show here and ask if listeners would like to get in touch with us. Where is it that they can find you? Take the microphone. Away well, you, you can find me taking the microphone from Joseph uh, at Mathemus55 on Twitter. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming some of these cards that we talked about formerly hating <laughs> over at twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast. We do that every Wednesday evening. We have guests on every single week as well. And it's just a great time to play with people in the community. So make sure you tune in Wednesday evenings, twitch.tv slash EDH Recast. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. You can hear me on my other podcast, CMDR Central. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH Recast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me embracing all the colors of the rainbow and the Magic the Gathering over at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter. And you can find the cast at EDH Recast on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you've got a question for us, you can also contact us at EDHRecast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase, who loves the color red, for assisting me with the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And we want to thank our sponsors, TCG Player and CardKingdom.com. And you can visit altersleeves.com slash EDH Recast for cool custom EDH Rec sleeves. Listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. <laughs> <laughs>